I, um, I was involved through the National Youth Leadership Council, and we ran their camps together, mm -hmm. remember, the McFick summer camps. Um, and then for uh, CMF, I've primarily been a program officer, and then, of course, various subcommittees or such that might have come up. Uh, MNA program officer, and then the Michigan Community Service Commission, a commissioner, six to seven years. So been involved with all of them, yeah. Absolutely, and I'll just come at it from, I was in Minnesota when I, when I became in touch with uh, a movement that was popping around the country and became aware of it, and I was actually in graduate school studying to be a clinical social worker, and I'll get more into this later when we talk about my journey, but I was really focusing on, I had a strong commitment to young people, but focusing on it from a clinical perspective of children and families. And so I was leading groups around self-esteem, children of divorce, children of violent homes. And I started noticing out in the streets that there was something happening in terms of more activity starting to build in which young people were no longer the recipients of the help from adults, but they were beginning to stand up and becoming a part of the solution. And um, in Minnesota, I was on a group called the Twin Cities Youth Policy Forum. And we began tapping into that, and we, it was a policy forum that was focused on youth workers and youth serving organizations. We would uh, hold forums that would bring about 200 people uh, together. And what we noticed was that suddenly there was this flip happening around young people as uh, actors instead of victims, young people as assets instead of uh, needy uh, recipients or recipients or act, uh, assets instead of focusing on the deficits of what young people needed. And we, I remember we had buttons that you know, youth as resources. We began really stepping into what was happening around the country. and. Um, and uh, what was the beginning of the youth service movement in the late 80s. And it was at that time that I was connected to two organizations, the Search Institute, which if you heard about Peter Benson, and then uh, Jim Kielsmeyer had founded the National Youth Leadership Council. And it was while I was in graduate school, I took on this position of the Twin Cities Youth Policy Forums that they had co-created. And that's when I got, I got a sense around there was this movement, and. I eventually came to work for the National Youth Leadership Council, and that's when I became aware. Uh, we thought we were progressive in Minnesota, but Michigan was actually further down the road than we were as a state. And that's when I ran into you, Kathy, ran into so many others uh, that were not only just talking about young people as, um, as assets and resources, you were really starting to put some firm um, stakes into the ground around it. And that was my first introduction to the Community Foundations Youth Project, which to me was one of the stellar projects around the country because it was having, it was doing two things. One, it was putting, um, it wasn't just, uh, it wasn't just talking about young people being in the driver's seat. It was actually uh, giving people the power and the decision making that comes with the distribution of resources. That was a powerful statement as to how much young people were trusted by the people here and, um, and how much responsibility they could take on. And so it was, to me, it was a premier, early out of the gate, stellar program that really showed um, the power of what young people could do. I didn't choose philanthropy. Okay. Philanthropy chose me. <laughs> And accidentally, it's one of those accidental, wonderful experiences. Um, I was actually a youth development professional and, um, and involved in youth camping, and I was very involved in young people and the whole notion of getting young people out into nature to, be at, to better understand their relationship with nature. I had an undergraduate in environmental studies, uh, wilderness education, designed an experiential undergraduate myself where I was out in the field two out of my four years and had a real, um, just had some very uh, crucial, pivotal experiences around how I believe people learn. And so that was a backdrop 
for uh, when I began running youth camps and realized that when people came to my camp, that was they were in northern Illinois, when they came to my camps, when they unpacked their clothes, they also unpacked their lives. And so I learned a lot about cutting my teeth on how important community is in terms of creating experiences for people, because it wasn't just young people, we had families involved, we had teenagers involved, how important it, community is and the support of community for people to uh, take the risks to more deeply understand themselves, to become vulnerable, vulnerable, and then to transform themselves. And so it was that backdrop that then led me as people unpacked their suitcases and their lives, they also unpacked their problems. And that was when I realized I really wanted to learn how to help people solve their problems more effectively. I went to Minnesota, the University of Minnesota, uh, decided to choose social work because I believed it was the most broad span degree. I looked at a, uh, psychology degrees, counseling degrees. These were all things that taught me about how you could support people in, in, in solving the problems of their lives. I chose social work in Minnesota because I wanted to a uh, broader degree and to be in a pro-social environment. That I wanted to be in a state that had very progressive social policy. And that was very much to their Finnish, Norwegian uh, roots that were brought over to Minnesota, very pro-social, very social oriented. So it was while I was there, and I started um, uh, doing internships and work after my graduate degree, that I was doing clinical social work with children, youth, and families, that I started noticing while I was leading groups with young people, again, about death in their family, violence in their family, whatever life was bringing to them, divorce, um, self-esteem issues, adoption, I noticed that while I was sitting around talking to young people about their lives, while I was running these youth policy forums, I was watching young people who were discovering who they were by engaging with their communities. So they weren't doing this in a unique, I mean, in kind of a, a vacuum. They were out in the community, and as they were giving and getting engaged to their community, they were radically changing how they saw themselves and their community was radically changing how they saw young people. And my final assessment was this was far more trans transformative. This was far more transformative than the groups that I were running, that I was running, sorry. So this notion of if you allow people to get into their community, experience, engage, more transformation was possible than sitting around and talking about whatever it was was on their minds. I took a job then with the National Youth Leadership Council. I realized that doing individual therapy wasn't changing things enough. I began understanding that I really was much more of a systems thinker. I didn't quite realize it, but it was my beginning of understanding that. Took uh, worked for the National Youth Leadership Council where I could have a national lens, ended up uh, being hired to manage a million dollar Kellogg grant around K through 12 service learning back in 1990. And over three years, I managed that grant. Again, learned more about community building, learned more about collective action with a group of players across the country that were very diverse. Native American man down in uh, New Mexico, uh, leaders out in Boston and in the Massachusetts area, as well as Washington. And we all came together and said, what do we want to move? Very similar to what Michigan was doing. Leaders coming together saying, what's the agenda? How can we, st how can we be strategic? And then um, it was after three years of managing that grant that I got a call from Joe Oros, who said, would you consider putting an application in. And I had found out it was uh, Stephanie Closey, who I had worked with in Iowa, had just come out of the Kellogg Foundation, had put my name forward. And I began my set of multiple visits to the Kellogg Foundation, and then um, eventually was hired by Joel, working with a small team to build this new area called the Philanthropy and Volunteerism Programming Area. 
Well, in the Kellogg Foundation back in the 80s, again, um, had a, the foundation has always had a, a commitment to young people. I believe Joel and his colleagues in the what was called the Youth and Education Programming Area started noticing this bubbling up of this service movement among young people. And they began getting more requests for grants, things, organizations called Christmas in April, uh, the Campus Outreach Opportunity League, COOL. Uh, the Corporation for National Service was beginning formed. Um, Norm Brown, our president at the time, was asked by President George Bush Sr. would he be a part of creating something called the Points of Light Foundation. So again, there were a number of confluences that were happening that was turning the Kellogg Foundation's attention in this direction. That's often how it works. We see what's happening out in the world based, by the, based on the tone or the content of the requests we're getting. We noticed that happening around philanthropy by and for communities of color. There was a period where suddenly we started getting these requests from uh, organizations that were working on building culturally based funds within foundations or community foundations. And that was another example of, huh, what's going on here? And we started learning more about that and crafted an entire body of work called now called Cultures of Giving. So what was that about? So Joel Oros, I believe, after having done some grants, made some grants around this youth service activity that was starting to pop up around the country, I believe that he had enough conversations uh, within the building with leadership to bring in some more uh, expertise and, and myself and another program officer were hired to bring in some expertise around this area, those of us who had been working in it, and to go ahead and create a body of work in which we would be funding it. We didn't know then that it would become a fourth leg of the foundation stool at the time, but we built up quite a big portfolio then, really funding a lot of these new efforts that were happening across the country. It, my parents were quite unconventional. My mother was a school teacher, my father was a farmer, but every summer, they were both, they both could step away from the farm and from the classroom, and they would get a map and draw a big circle around the country, up into Canada, a little bit down into Mexico, and we would spend a month as a family traveling around the country, seeing the world. And by the time I was 12, I had been to 42 of these United States, and I had been exposed to so much of the grandeur of this country. We stayed at the national parks when there weren't very many people there. And we were exposed to all kinds of, it was all kinds of educational activities. And it was by being able to see our nation and to meet so many different people and to go into Mexico and to go to the little Mexican church and to go up into Canada and climb up the steps of the cathedral in Montreal on our knees because that was the local tradition. It, it actually, I think, built a fire in me for experiential education and for understanding how crucial wilderness and the out of doors were. So that led me to then get involved in youth camping. And I think I understood how important youth experiences are. That uh, what I heard in my camps all the time, I would have, how, how I got into community was that I directed these camps for a good, I was involved with these local camps for a good seven or eight years. And I saw how year after year, young people would come back and they would tell me over and over again, I get to be here who I cannot be at home. And I think it, put a, it, it built a fire and a passion in me in terms of understanding how crucial these early experiences are for young people. We still, I still have camp staff that are all connected on Facebook, campers that connect up to these early formative experiences. And I ask, why are they so formative? And what I came down to thinking is that it's so much about acceptance, love, community, belonging, within the context of an environment like a camp. And so I think it's these youth development perspectives, um, these youth development experiences that really shaped my commitment to making sure that we have opportunities for young people.
you know, when I was at the Kellogg Foundation, many times we would have Jane Addams Fellows from Indiana University. Many young people would come through the Kellogg Foundation and meet with us as program officers. And many times I would be asked to do informational interviews with young people in their 20s usually who are exploring careers. And it'll bring me back to my original story of how did I get into philanthropy. They would say, I want to be a foundation program officer. What do I do? And I would say to them time and time again, and I just had an informational interview with another young woman probably a month ago asking the very same thing, 25 years old, trying to impart her path. And my theme that I say is not changed over the last 15 years, and it reflects my own experience. One is that I never intended to get involved in philanthropy. It was never on my radar screen. In fact, I, I had hardly interacted with program officers myself. But what I did take the time to do, and what I was blessed with mentors and employers and other key influencers in my life, was that every single one of them around my path, at least I found and I held on to them, were the people who helped me find my passion. And they helped reflect to me, what was it? What were my gifts to give? What was I good at naturally, right? And when I think when a person can get in touch with that and stay in touch with that and shape their work life around it, there's a fire and a passion that gets mixed with the experience and with the knowledge that we each gain over time. And it's when you get that combination, you become a very powerful actor in the world. And I think that how I got into philanthropy was I was just passionate about what I was doing. And I, it was just fortuitous that I was in the right place at the right time. And someone to manage a Kellogg grant was needed. And I did that work. And then there was a need at the Kellogg Foundation. And I said yes. We both said yes. So my, my advice is always do what you love. Pay attention to not only your work, but to the broader field of what you're engaged in. And then let philanthropy find you, because it will. In my own life journey, I think what brought me to the social work perspective was that I was raised in a middle class family, maybe lower middle class. We were out on a farm. We raised, we were 90% self-sufficient. Um, I think it was probably my Catholic upbringing as well as my own um, parents' agrarian ethic that on a farm, and when you live in a rural community, it's very much a part of life that if one farmer needs help, everyone goes over and helps. It's the thing you talk about with the Amish barn raisings. When you live in rural America, that's how you survive. And I think that ethic combined with the social justice lens that I received from a bunch of young radical nuns when I was in high school has influenced me to always ask the question of who are, where, who, who are the haves and who are the have-nots? And what's the responsibility of those haves to those have-nots? And I think that these are crucial, crucial questions as we move into what's an ongoing recession that some have already called a depression because it's felt very unequally right now. And I think we in Michigan have a strong responsibility. We've been called the canary in the coal mine around this uh, particular recession. And I, would, I think we can do better than we're even doing around thinking about the economy and who's it affecting and how is it affecting whom. And so at the foundation, we really have placed a high emphasis on uh, racial equity. So you ask, who are the have-nots? Who has and who doesn't? What are the various uh, prejudices and institutional uh, biases that we can sometimes take for granted, institutional racism? And how do we make sure we really weave that into our consciousness as we move forward? So I, I haven't brought that out, but I just think it's a crucial agenda for Michigan. I think we have a long ways to go in it, and that I think it's our personal challenge. And for those of us that continue to keep building the infrastructure, 
I think we need a very particular uh, focus on weaving that into what we do.